Okay. Let's go here. Perfect. Good afternoon uh, to everybody who is logging in. My name is Alan Polito, and I'm the uh, Outreach Director for the Princeton Review, and uh, I work out of the Orange County, California office, so I'm going to assume it is afternoon everywhere since it's 12 p.m. here in uh, California. Um, a little bit of background about myself and about what we're going to discuss for today. Uh, if you guys can see the PowerPoint slide, uh, the title of my presentation is Success on the SAT and ACT the two uh, standardized exams that uh, the majority of colleges today continue to require if you're planning to apply to a four-year uh, school um, uh, as a freshman. Okay. Now, so background for myself, a little bit of history. I've worked for Princeton Review for 16 years now. I started back in 1997. Um, and sometimes that does shock people because I think I still look a little bit young uh, for my age. But uh, I've, I've done this for over a decade and a half. And I've primarily worked out of California, and I'm in charge of uh, plenty of the Southern California schools. Like I said, in Orange County uh, is, is where I primarily work. I am certified as an SAT teacher, instructor, and trainer. I also teach for the PSAT and the GRE and the GMAT. That's for, uh, for the, uh, of course, older students who want to get a master's, a PhD, or possibly an MBA to go to business school. Okay, So let's go ahead and get started with this presentation uh, for today. And you can see my contact information is up on the first slide. You're all welcome to contact me via email, and I'm very happy to, uh, to, to respond to you guys. And if I can't help you locally, I will certainly um, defer you to some of my local colleagues, OK? Um, so the tests at a glance. What's very important before we jump into any of the more hard-hitting and valuable testing strategies is for you guys to have a basic information, a foundation, if you will, about each of these exams. I know some of this information should be uh, redundant for some of you. You might already know what it is, but especially for those people who may not know this information, I want to give you a little bit of background so you understand what we're talking about. Okay. When you say the SAT, particularly in my region, in the West Coast and in the East Coast, the SAT typically has uh, people nodding their heads and they smile and they sort of understand what test you're talking about. Uh, 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 opposite of that, the ACT, when you say ACT in our region, especially the West Coast and the East Coast, a lot of people are not quite as comfortable or familiar with the ACT. This is merely a geographical difference between the two exams. And what I want to stress to all of you, especially here at the beginning of the presentation, is that every college out there will accept either test type. Both the SAT and the ACT are acceptable, viable, standardized tests. I say that and I stress that because in 16 years of doing this, I still run into plenty of parents who are unconvinced that one test is equal to the other depending on where you are. If you live in Michigan, for example, you grew up understanding the ACT. And what, uh, what that simply means is that it's a geographical thing. It's a marketing ploy that these test writers were able to apply. So SAT is more successful and more popular in the western regions and the eastern, and the ACT is more popular in the Midwest and southern. But that does not affect how colleges look at them. I want you guys to understand that colleges could not possibly care less about the test type you take, but they do care a great deal about the test score that you turn in. Okay, It's the score that matters, not the test type. I promise that you will hear differently from that even after my presentation. Pay no mind to people who tell you that one test is better than the other. As far as validity to the colleges, once again, they are equal uh, in their eyes. Okay. So taking a look at the SAT first, and some of you have already typed in some questions, thank you. We'll leave questions towards the end of the presentation so that I can get through my information first, and then we'll, we'll tackle them together, okay? So moving on with this SAT, just a basic framework of what the SAT looks like, okay? It's changed a lot if you're a parent who took it or possibly didn't even have to take it, depending on what your background happens to be. But the SAT is very much an endurance-based exam today. It's almost four hours long. That's four Glee episodes, back to back to back to back. That's a long test, okay? And there are 10 total sections in the exam, and the major ideas or subjects that the SAT is testing are called critical reading, math, 
and writing skills. So you can see that on the slide. Each of these sections is scored on a grid of 200 to 800 points. You get a 200 for each section, for each subject, if you simply show up, remember your name, and bubble in all that information correctly. Okay? So one of the things you have to know now is that a perfect test score on the SAT is 2,400 points because that's three subjects of reading, math, and writing multiplied by 800 points each. Okay, so 3 times 800 is 2,400 points. That's also important to point out because for parents who might have taken the previous version of the SAT, dad's score on the 1600 scale isn't that impressive anymore. Okay, if you have a mom or dad say, well, I got a 1420 when I took it, that's, that's not that impressive in today's SAT. You also have an essay section, which is 25 minutes long for the SAT, and I'll come back to that uh, later on. Okay, so that's the basic framework of the SAT exam. Its rival test, the ACT, as I said, is more popular in the Midwest and southern regions of the country. That's, um, and what I mean by that is it's more popular by the number of people who take it. Here's an interesting fact that you might want to know about the exams. Last year, 2012, was the first time ever that more students took the ACT over the SAT. So more and more people, people are beginning to realize that the ACT is just, a valid as, just as valid an exam versus its rival test. And since you have more of the population living on the, on the coasts, it makes sense that for a long time that the SAT was the more popular exam simply by numbers. Last year, that's the first time the ACT beat out the SAT. And uh, so that had, certainly has some repercussions. The basic framework for the ACT is that it's three hours and 35 minutes long. So yes, if they wanted to sort of go into detail, the ACT can claim that they are a shorter test, which is true by about 10 minutes. There are five sections that are tested, and those uh, five sections also consist of the different subject types, which are English, math, reading, science, and then what they call the writing component, which is also basically an essay section. And that's a 30-minute essay section, so it's longer by about five minutes versus the SAT. The ACT is scored on a grid from 1 to 36 per section, 1 being the minimum, 36 being the maximum. Okay, And the composite is a fancy term for the average, which basically means that an ACT test score is uh, calculated by taking the average of your scores from English, math, reading and science, and then uh, basically spitting that out to you called the composite, okay? That's different from the SAT because the SAT actually adds up. It's a sum of the three different sections, whereas the ACT is an average of the four sectional scores that you have. That's a very important difference, and I will return back to that idea and tell you why that's important, especially to you guys, okay? So for the next slide, again, working within the, the fundamentals of what the, these tests are actually uh, testing for your students, what's on the SAT? So here's a slide that shows that. You have your three major topics of reading, math, and writing, perfect scores of 800 each. On the reading section, you still have what are called sentence completions, which uh, basically test vocabulary and reading skills. I'll come back to that later on and passage-based reading, also known as reading comprehension. Basically, any standardized test you can possibly think of is going to have some kind of passage-based reading. That doesn't matter if you are somebody in middle school taking a standardized test or somebody who wants to get a PhD in whatever field. Okay, You're always going to have reading-based passages. Under the math, these are the topics that are tested on the SAT. Algebra 1, Algebra 2, geometry and arithmetic, which might be a surprise to some parents and students, especially if you have somebody who is advanced in math to begin with. You can clearly see that the topics uh, on the SAT in this case uh, could be uh, subjects and classes that your students have passed one, two, possibly three years ago. So a lot of times the best math students actually might struggle on these standardized tests because they are um, being tested on topics that they have not studied for a, quite a long time. The hardest math topic on the SAT is Algebra 2, as it says on the slide, but you guys should also know there's only about three to four Algebra 2 based questions on the test. So that means you don't have to 
overstress algebra 2 preparation for the SAT because it represents maybe one question per hour, which isn't very much. So in fact, if you're not scoring well into the 650s or 700 out of 800 on the math section, you really shouldn't stress too much about Algebra 2. You should stress more about Algebra 1, Geometry, and Arithmetic. On the writing section of the SAT, the majority of the concepts will test grammar in various ways, okay? And the essay, which is handwritten, is worth about 30% of that total score. When you're adding your SAT scores together, you only add your reading, your math, and your writing scores. You do not add the grammar, multiple choice, or essay sections at all. Okay? On the ACT side of things, okay, there's more information, so I had to use one a slide with no pictures. On the math of the ACT, you still have arithmetic, algebra one, algebra two, and geometry, but there's also going to be approximately four trigonometry and pre-calculus questions. Okay? So that's why when people say the ACT is technically the more difficult test. By concept, that's correct. The ACT tests a, a math level that is one year more advanced versus the SAT. But the lesson to be learned here again is that you do not overstress trigonometry or pre-calculus when preparing for the ACT. You are really talking about the majority of questions revolving around arithmetic, algebra one, algebra two, and geometry. The following ACT subject reading will have long reading passages, okay? On the English section, it's going to be multiple choice of grammar. And on the science section, you have charts and experiments. Now, here is the strangest part of the ACT. And here's where a lot of students will have a difficult time taking the exam because they have misconceptions of what the science uh, section is actually testing. Now, the strange and ironic part about this, of course, is that the ACT science section does not really test science. So you can see there it says on the slide, no science content. What does that mean? Well, it means that if a student has taken biology, physics, and chemistry and believe that, okay, if there's an ACT science section, that means I'm going to have to review things like the parts of a cell or maybe the carbon cycle. Or perhaps in physics, I need to remember gravity, 9.8 meters per second per second. Or in chemistry, I need to know uh, the elements. I need to remember how to balance equations. None of these things actually show up on the ACT science section. And most people are surprised to learn that the ACT science is simply a reading test. It's just reading. All the information and answers you're actually going to need are in the passages themselves. They've given it to you already. It looks and feels like science. It's going to have labs, charts, experiments, data tables, all sorts of different setups. And it's going to look and sound like your typical science question, but it's really just reading comprehension. But, so that's one of the secrets to the ACT, which is you don't actually need to study up on scientific content. It's reading comprehension and understanding how to translate the information in front of you. Okay? And of course, you have, once again, the writing component, which they call, which is also the essay section on the ACT. Okay? So, what's a good score in these tests? Well, the average score on the SAT for juniors, 11th graders, is about 1,500 points total. So, that's about 500 points per section on math, reading, and writing. The average score on the ACT for juniors is about 21 points. Remember, it's 1 to 36. 21 is the average score for each section and the composite as well. What, is, what do those numbers mean outside of just the test themselves? Well, scoring around average on these exams is competitive for many of what we would call state schools or state colleges. How can you determine if a school is a state school? Typically, it says state in the name. So that's a pretty good way to do it. So in, in California, San Diego State, uh, San Francisco State, Cal State Fullerton, that would make sense. Florida State, uh, Michigan State, those are state schools. Okay, so scoring around average is, generally speaking, competitive for many state schools. That's a broad generalization, of course. Uh, you're going to have some that are more competitive than that and some that are less competitive than that. You also need to pay attention to the other important factors, such as the GPA, classes taken, essays that you may be asked to write, recommendations, so on and so forth. 
okay? But truly and honestly, a good score on either test is the score that helps you get into your top choice college. And that's going to be different from student to student. I interact with plenty of students uh, all the time, and somebody might ask me what it takes to get into Harvard. Another student might ask me what it takes to get into Texas Christian University. Another might ask me what it takes to get into NYU uh, or Stanford, right? So all these different colleges have different uh, requirements and, and, uh, and averages that they advertise, okay? It says here also that different colleges, yes, look for different scores, and sometimes they will use them to determine some type of financial aid, especially what they call merit-based aid. Essentially, the higher test scores, the more attractive you look to a lot of colleges because it boosts up their data and what they can advertise, and therefore they will offer to pay you more money, basically to ask you to come to their school. Okay? It's a legal bribe, is what I like to call it. And of course, you're going to want to identify the colleges you want to attend and find out what their average scores happen to be. And there's a lot of information out there. Okay? Now, what do the tests actually measure if they're not really testing things you, you uh, learn every day in high school? It basically tests how well you take the exams themselves. Don't take your scores personally. They are not uh, a judgment on your value or your character and certainly not a measure of your intelligence. And I meet way too many students who take their SAT and ACT test scores personally, especially if you're a student who is doing really well in high school but struggles on these tests. That's a very common plight, and that's why companies like Princeton Review actually exist to help you boost your test scores. Anybody with the proper coaching can learn how to increase his or her scores, which I will get into further detail in this uh, presentation. Why do students struggle with the SAT and ACT? I've already named a couple of those reasons, but let's review some that you may not have heard of. These tests are different from the tests students take in school, and so you need to learn a different approach to doing extremely well. Let me put it in these terms. If these exams, the SAT and ACT, actually tested what you do and learn in high school, then your GPA would be a great predictor of how you do on the SAT or ACT. If you bring me a straight A student, that straight A student should, of course, do really well on the SAT and ACT. You bring me somebody who has Ds and Fs, then they should struggle on the SAT and ACT. But we really know that that's not the case. You just have to survey all the juniors or seniors that you might know and try to compare what their GPA is to their SAT and ACT scores before they started pre preparation. And you'll find that there is no correlation there, okay? So they, they're very different in how they test these things, okay? How are they different from what they test in school? Well, first of all, the tests are quite long. The only thing that really compares to these tests uh, for what they normally do in high school would be something like AP exams. And AP exams are at the end of the school year, and you spend about seven to eight months actually training for those because you're theoretically taking the AP exam or the IB course. So the tests are quite long, and it's a shock to the system for a teenager to have to take a four-hour exam. The SAT especially is written to trick students. The answer choices are filled with common traps. One of the reasons this is true is that because these tests are fundamentally multiple choice, you have to make them trickier because you have actually given the, the answer choice as one of the options in front of the students. Therefore, you have to build in more traps, more things to fool students because it's a multiple choice exam as opposed to mostly an essay or free response or verbal exam. Okay, So the SAT especially has many more tricks attached to it, uh, and that's the test writers. The other reason is actually more financial, which is when your student takes an official SAT or ACT and does not do as well as he or she would like, guess what you do? You pay another $50 to have your student take the exam over again. It's a wonderful racket. So if you apply that to high school, if I were your Spanish teacher, I would say, Bienvenidos. Thank, uh, welcome to, to my class. For Spanish class, I will write your exams. You each will pay me $50. I will score your exams. If you don't like your score, no problem. Pay me another $50 each. I'll write another one and we'll administer and start the cycle all over again. That is, in a nutshell, what the standardized test industry is like. Therefore, it, it, it benefits the SAT and ACT when your students have to take it multiple times. How do they ensure that happens? 
they make the test more difficult than what, the, what your students face in school. Grammar, of course, has little emphasis in most schools. Grammar school is, in fact, in elementary. You don't really talk about that proactively in middle school and certainly not in high school. Okay, so grammar, it's, a, it's an essential portion of these exams, but it's not something that is tested, uh, uh, that is taught, I should say, at the high school level. And, of course, if you take a look at today's world, texting, IMing, um, to Twitter, Instagram, everything else, social media, there's all sorts of uh, misspellings and pronunciations and poor grammar everywhere. Another reason is that the math tested is content students learned a long time ago, and I talked about that before. Okay, and let's see here. And finally, essay writing isn't usually a timed section in school. When high school students are assigned essays in school, it's typically under at least one or two days. Come back Wednesday or Thursday with your first draft, or perhaps it's one to two weeks or even longer than that. But in this case, they're given 25 to 30 minutes only, including thinking about the prompt that's been given to them. And that's why essay writing is a difficult thing, even for the most gifted writers. The best writers out there don't spend half an hour to write their best work and turn it in. The best writers sit and think about what they're going to write. They brainstorm. They write thought bubbles. They have bullet points. Then they write and rewrite and draft and edit and critique. Those are what the best writers do. And unfortunately, the format of these exams is not conducive to that. Okay? And yep, a couple more people have asked questions. Remember that I will get to those questions at the end of the presentation. Okay? So here's a little, a little something to show you guys how the test writers uh, uh, approach designing the exam. Are you an average Joe or Joanne? Okay? So you guys have three seconds to pick a number. No cheating, just think of the first number that you thought of. Okay? And since uh, we're all on the internet, you, you can actually shout it out loud. Nobody can hear you. Okay? So, I bet that you guys chose a number between 1 and 10. Now, some of you more unique people might have said negative 5 or 136 or 3 quarters. Okay? 3 quarters is still between 1 and 10, by the way. But the majority of you, I'm sure, picked a single digit number between 1 and 10. And that's simply a very predictable thing. Now, obviously, this is a basic example I'm, going, I'm showing you, okay? But it shows how predictable human beings are and how much test writers can basically leverage that weakness. In fact, you may not know this, but the test writers actually hire psychologists uh, to help them design uh, the test uh, questions themselves. So they, they know which wrong answer choices you like, and they put them in there on purpose. So here's another one. If I say peanut butter, what's the first word that comes to mind? You might think jelly. If I say up, you might think down. Again, some more, some more unique people listening to me might have come up with something else, okay? But ultimately, you can see how they can prey on these uh, predictable uh, behaviors uh, from, from people, especially teenagers, okay? So here are some differences between the two. Okay, number one, the SAT test vocabulary. Now, if you're a parent who took the previous SAT or have an older child who took the previous iteration, then you remember those days in which uh, uh, the SAT uh, and preparation for it meant memorizing three to 4,000 brand new vocab words you were never, ever going to use again. Okay, so the SAT continues to test vocabulary today. However, there are far fewer SAT questions that test vocabulary in today's format. The analogies are gone. They got rid of them back in 2005. So that means although vocab is still tested on the SAT, it is not the majority uh, concept. And I, I stress that because of this reason. So parents pay close attention to this, especially to the moms who are listening out there. Plenty of parents, especially moms, who mean really, really well, will go out there and purchase vocab dictionaries, vocab words of the day, enroll in SAT classes that spend an inordinate amount of time memorizing flashcards and basically memorizing the dictionary. Okay? Here's what you guys should know. I'm not telling you to ignore vocab, vocab memorization on the SAT. It is still there. But most of you and your students spend way too much time memorizing vocabulary. And here's why I say that. There are three times, three times more reading-based questions on the SAT versus vocabulary-based questions. 
and the vocab and the reading both make up your critical reading score. So if you truly want to improve your student's critical reading score, it is not going to be through memorizing thousands of vocab words because there are three times more reading-based questions. Therefore, weak critical reading scores should focus three times more study time on critical reading. I want you guys to understand that, okay? So if you're going to have your students study for 10 minutes of SAT vocab memorization, guess what? Then they need to spend 30 minutes studying for the critical reading. And the reason vocabulary is such a, such a favorable thing uh, for mothers and parents to lean on is that it's something tangible. It's hard to quantify reading comprehension. You can't measure Billy's reading skills unless you give him a test to do so, okay? But vocabulary, parents can think to themselves, oh, I made him memorize 100 brand new flashcards, and that's why I feel good about myself. When in fact, you should have stressed a lot more study time for the reading. And one last point about that, if you're enrolled in any type of SAT class, program, or tutoring, and they spend a whole heck of a lot of time in vocab memorization, that is, in my opinion, a wonderful way to have glorified babysitting. It is the lowest form of SAT preparation because I can simply sit in front of a class and tell them for the next three hours, memorize these 1,000 words. I'm going to sit up here and update my Facebook status, take some pictures, and respond on Twitter while you guys suffer for the next three to four hours. I don't have to teach anything. This is just vocab memorization. Go. And that's why I call it glorified babysitting. Remember, I'm not telling you to ignore vocab. I am telling you to increase your reading study time relative to your vocab memorization. Here's another difference. The ACT has a science section. I already discussed a few slides ago what that science section means to the ACT and how it has no content. It's mainly reading comprehension. The SAT essay is required, whereas the ACT essay is optional. That's important to note. The SAT essay will be given at the beginning of the SAT in its section number one. The ACT essay or writing component is given at the end of the ACT and you do have the choice of leaving it. You can skip it, you can get up and leave, and for the next 30 minutes anybody who stays gets to take it. Now why is that the case? Because again the ACT is great at marketing. Therefore when they have to discuss the differences between ACT and SAT, ACT people can claim, oh, well, our test is actually much shorter. If you decide to skip the optional writing component, you take off another 30 minutes. Therefore, our exam is just slightly over three hours long. Those other guys, they're almost four hours long and you have to take it. So why would a student not take the ACT essay? Uh, that would be if they were applying to colleges that do not require it. Here's where state schools come into play again. Many state colleges do not require an essay component, but universities, private schools, and most definitely Ivy League schools absolutely require that ACT essay. Our advice from Princeton Review is this. If you're going to sit there for three hours to take the ACT, spend another half hour and just go ahead and take it. Okay, because you never know when your mind changes or your friends' minds change and they decide to apply a university and you're left out because you did not complete the full ACT. You cannot take the ACT essay by itself. You will have to sit for the full three and a half hours again. and You don't want to be in that position. More on the essays. The SAT essay is philosophical and the ACT essay is more teen friendly. Here's some examples. The SAT essay is something that reads like feng shui or something you might read in a fortune cookie somewhere okay so an SAT essay prompt uh, might say something like um, the greatest griefs are those we cause ourselves do people often cause their own problems that's an SAT essay sample an ACT essay is something like do you think wearing seat belts is a good idea or how do you feel about high school uniforms you can see the differences in philosophy between those two. Okay. Next one, I mentioned earlier that the SAT is trickier, but tests easier concepts, such as on the math, and the ACT is harder, but more straightforward. Okay. 
And by the way, how does that affect how your students might take it? By gender, statistically, the boys, men, tend to do better on the SAT, and the women, the girls, tend to do better on the ACT. The ACT, anecdotally, is more like a high school-based exam. So because girls tend to get better GPAs in high school versus the boys, they're used to that kind of format. They're used to something that's a bit more content-based. Okay. And finally, I mentioned it there, the SAT is more technique based, whereas the ACT is more content based. Okay? It's easier to learn techniques, it's more difficult to learn content. Okay? Um, and I'll come back to that idea as we progress. Okay, so uh, how are the tests scored? Basically for this slide, the one thing I want you guys to understand is on the bottom there. On the SAT, if you cannot eliminate any answer choices, leave it blank. Random guessing is bad on the SAT, okay? It's not good because they actually take points away when you get something wrong. So here's a sports analogy, okay? I, I like basketball, so, so I'll use basketball. Um, in basketball, if you make the shot, you get points, whether it's two or three or one on the free throw. You get some kind of points. If you miss in basketball, there's no penalty. There's no penalty, okay? Whatever happens after that just happens. But if basketball switched to SAT-based rules, that means if you miss a shot in basketball, they take points away from the scoreboard. Imagine how that would change the game significantly and how it's played. So theoretically, people and players would take fewer shots, except for Kobe Bryant, who just keeps shooting, okay? Whereas on the ACT, there is no penalty for getting it wrong. So ACT does operate under today's basketball rules. If you miss a, a, a problem on ACT, there's no penalty. You just don't get any points. So we call it letter of the day. If you don't know what to do on an ACT, and that should actually say questions that you don't understand. Okay, so let me see if this works. Oh, yes, I think it does. Okay, it should say understand, not work, okay? On questions you don't understand, it's called letter of the day. If you're running out of time, you have 10 questions to go, and there's only 20 seconds left, you bubble straight down. Just bubble straight down, okay? You'll actually have a better, uh, a better chance uh, of getting more questions correct, okay? Those are, that's a big difference between the two exams, so you would better make sure you pay attention to that. So the summary of that on the SAT, you are only allowed to guess if you can eliminate at least one to two incorrect choices, whereas on the ACT, you always guess if you don't know what to do. That's very important, and don't mix those two up. Okay, so on to some more strategies, okay? Imagine you're driving your car down the freeway, okay? You might call it somewhere else around the country. I don't know what you guys call it. Here we call it freeways, okay? And you're going, you know, a legal 77 miles per hour, okay? And you're listening to the radio, and you're listening to your favorite song, except it gets interrupted by, your, by the DJ. And the announcer said, uh, basically tells you that there is an accident. There's a major accident about two miles down the road from where you're driving to. Okay? What should your response be? Okay? Obviously, what you need to do is to prepare to slow down or to brake completely to, to a full stop. Or some of you might have said, well, think of another route, maybe exit, so on and so forth. Some teenagers, when asked that question, they say, oh, I'm going I'm to you know, pedal to the metal. That's not what we're doing here, obviously. Okay? If you're, the appropriate response is to slow down and prepare to stop. Okay? That is the essence of pacing on this exam. And here's why. So here's a visual aid for you guys. Okay? So there's the car, and there's the brick wall representing the accident down the road. Okay? Easy, medium, and difficult are basically showing you the progression of the level of difficulty. Okay? Now, this pertains especially to the math sections for both SAT and ACT and for the vocabulary portion of the SAT as well. Okay? Not so much in reading because reading is so subjective. There's no way to measure what's weak or strong for one person or the other. Okay? So that's a bit more subjective. But what you guys should know 
is basically all the questions are worth the same number of points. You may not have known that. So a number one is supposed to be very easy, okay? A number 20 is supposed to be very difficult, in fact, the hardest. But you may not have known they are worth the same number of points, identical points. So struggling for five minutes on a number 20 gives you the same reward as focusing on a number one, which takes about 20 seconds of your time, if that. So one of the most common questions I get from students is, Alan, how can you and the Princeton Review teach me to speed up on this test? I don't answer that question until they've given me at least one practice test. Because what I typically find is that most students should slow down rather than speed up. And that's because of what I just told you. The questions are worth exactly the same points. So the student who is trying to speed up is like the person who decided, I heard there's an accident two miles down the road. My response is to go to 100 miles per hour now, which is a bad idea. Okay? Students who are basically struggling on these exams benefit from slowing down because they take more time to not make the careless errors on the easy and medium level questions and also avoiding the more difficult problems that they get wrong anyway. On the SAT, that's doubly negative for them because they penalize you when you get it wrong. So here's a numeric way to say this. If your student is an SAT student, and your student is not scoring 650 points or higher on a given section, that is a student who should not be attempting to finish entire sections. So a student with a 470 SAT writing score, that's below a 650, right? So that student should not even attempt to read all the writing questions. They should slow down and increase their accuracy. On the ACT, it's the same. It's not quite as effective because it doesn't have a penalty, but it's the same premise because you want to slow down and focus on, on getting the low-hanging fruit. And then when you run out of time on the ACT, guess what I said? Letter of the day, right? So it all should make sense. The next slide. Okay, just waiting here. Okay, here's another one. Actually, let me see, I think we might have skipped that one. Sorry about that, guys. Let me just uh, get this going here in a second. Almost there. Okay. Let's see the next slide. Okay, yeah, so I, it was correct, okay? So, here's another technique applicable, again, to both SAT and ACT. As you can tell, um, I'm very passionate about this stuff. And this is the stuff that we teach at Princeton Review. And so, um, I can take, uh, we can take even like the, the most advanced student who is struggling on even a couple of things and show them some of these techniques and strategies that will allow them to basically use multiple methods to answer the same question. Frankly, I don't care how you get these problems correct. I just care that you do, okay? So one of the things that we do to empower students is to show them different ways to approach the same uh, question. So here's another example. This one pertains to math, okay? So let's pretend you're at the candy store, and let's pretend you're basically looking to buy some of those uh, sour belts, okay? One of my favorites. So you're looking to buy some sour belts, and uh, you have a dollar, okay? And they cost 10 cents a piece. You want to buy three pieces, 10 cents a piece, you want to buy three pieces. You give the clerk a dollar, okay, you get your three pieces, how much change do you get back? You should have thought 70 cents, okay? You come back, you buy some more sour belts, this time the red ones, which happen to be more expensive, and they cost 25 cents a piece. You buy two, you hand the clerk a dollar, how much change do you get back? You should have thought 50 cents. Okay? You go back a third time. They now call, but something has changed. And here's what has changed. They now cost X cents a piece. You want to buy Y pieces, they cost, and you give them Z dollars. How much change do you get back? Most of you probably scratch your heads or are thinking, 
wait, let me get a piece of paper, let me get a calculator, say that again. And a couple of you might have ventured to guess, maybe even saying something like Z minus XY, which is still incorrect, okay? You have to compensate for the fact that it's dollars and cents, so you have to do Z over 100 minus XY. And even if you did get that, then kudos to you, you probably don't need too much help. But I know that most of you had no idea what to do, or at least slowed down and stopped when I changed it to the letters, which they call variables in math. But that's exactly what the tests do. They take what would be a normal situation, those are your, your sour belts, plus the money, equals what change do you get? Plugging in is a technique that we embrace and teach at Princeton Review. In fact, if I had just one hour to teach every high school student how to drastically improve their SAT or ACT math score, this is what I would teach. There are more techniques, obviously, but this is the most powerful one. It can tackle anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of your math questions on the test, okay? Remember, I'm not saying that if you're naturally good at math that you should use this, but so if you're missing only one or two math problems, you're just fine, okay? But when it comes to the majority of you, especially listening to this, I'm sure you need more help than that. So what plugging in basically does is it changes and it takes away the variables. It takes away the letters and it teaches students how to plug in numbers once again. So when they say X, Y, and Z, we teach students to ignore that. And we teach them to plug in numbers that make sense to them. Two, three, four, or five. Use numbers that make sense for you. Okay? So in this slide, which would you rather think about? Take a look at those two. On the left, you have an equation with variables. And on the right, you have 2 plus 10. I don't care how good you are at algebra. I'm good at algebra. I was a math major. Okay? But when I tackle the SAT and ACT, I don't do the things math majors are supposed to do. I don't do the things that your high school teacher tells you you're supposed to do. I use this technique because it's faster. It will beat any algebra process out there. Again, if you're good at algebra and you're comfortable and you're getting the score you want, you don't really need this. But for most of you, you need this, and it's something that we do teach in the classes, okay? So the basic idea is plugging in numbers that make sense throughout the word problem, okay? Obviously, I would need more time to tell you exactly how to use it, but this gives you an idea and maybe allows your students to practice. Plugging in is a better, faster method to solve math problems, okay? I can beat any algebra process by using plugging in. The reading section, okay? So I mentioned earlier that you're going to have reading sections on every standardized test that you take out there. And I may not have mentioned that the reading section is also typically the most hated section for any standardized test. If you uh, uh, Any standardized test. So if you're pre-med, you want to go to med school, when you take your pre-med exam, the MCAT, you're going to hate the reading section. Okay? And that's true for almost every test out there. Okay? So here's what the typical tester looks like during the reading section. Okay? So maybe that looks like you're a student. Okay? So what happens is readers or testers on the reading section basically follow the same premise and the same process, which is not the best way to approach these exams. It's not their fault. They weren't told how to do it anywhere, any other way. But let me describe to you what happens. On the SAT or ACT reading section, first of all, when the student flips, okay, you flip the booklet and finds that the next section is reading, they all groan in pain. Okay? They all groan because they know it's a reading section coming up. On the math, they're thinking, well, at least I was doing something. I have my calculator, which will help bail me out. But reading is very boring. Okay? And then what they do is they get to the first passage. Maybe there's seven paragraphs entitled, A Day in the Life of Benjamin Franklin. Okay? He was an inventor, another name for jobless. Okay? Or maybe it's talking about recycling or the discovery of the ancient Incan city of Machu Picchu. Topics I promise you that your teenagers are not discussing during lunchtime in high school, okay? So they get to that section and that passage, and they have to decide, huh, what do I do? Some of them decide, you know what, I promised mom that I would try on this test, so I'm going to read this. So they spend 18 out of 20 minutes reading this passage, and after seven paragraphs, they look up, eyes are glazed over, deer in the headlights, and they're thinking, I have no idea what I just read effectively having wasted their time. Other students who think they're a little bit smarter will decide, you know what, I heard you can just skim the passage. Maybe read 
you know, uh, back and forth, left to right. Just every other word, every other sentence. So I'm going to skim it. And the laziest testers, especially the boys, will think, oh, I heard I can just skip the passage altogether and go to the questions. Okay? Those are three different ways to approach this, uh, the reading section. Which way is best? All three. It really just depends on the kind of tester that you are. So what you have to do first is identify your reading style. And don't lie to yourself. You're 16, 17 years old. You've had a decade and a half to determine what type of reader you are. You know if you're somebody who reads at an A plus level, at a B minus level, or a D minus level. Okay? So you have to approach it differently depending on your reading abilities. Okay? The next thing you have to learn okay, is how to rephrase the questions. So what they're going to do is give you phrases. They're not even questions. They give you phrases that don't even have question marks at the end. So what was an example might be, the author mentions the flock of seagulls in lines 52 to 65 in order to, and that's not really a question, is it? It's just a phrase. So your students have to learn to rephrase that using one of these three words. What, why, how. And you ask your students to practice rephrasing the questions they're seeing. Again, they're not even really questions. So my example, author mentions flock of seagulls in lines 52 to 65 in order to, you might say, why does the author mention flock of seagulls? Okay, so that's what you want to do. You want to rephrase the questions and that allows you to remember the questions and to understand them better as you're going through this section. It is, that is a skill I promise you most students are not even aware of and therefore are not doing. Number three, active reading when searching for the answer. You're going to want to actively read, and that means using your pen, using your pen to mark the parts where you believe you've found the answer. It also keeps you awake during the most boring part of the test, which is going to benefit your score. Map the passage also means using your pen, okay, using your pen and basically marking on the passage itself right on the booklet where you found the specific answers to these questions and once you what you basically be able to see if you are looking for question the answer to question number four but you marked where you found question number three it'll be below that that's called mapping the passage and finally eliminate incorrect choices process of elimination is key when it comes to the reading you have to find some incorrect answer choices especially if you're not confident about finding the one correct one. Okay, next passage. Almost done here, and we'll move on to your questions. Okay, so essays. This is something that's going to apply to both uh, SAT and ACT once again, okay, and I'll point out any, di any differences, okay. These are the handwritten essays, and remember that you uh, you only have 25 to 30 minutes to write these things, and they're handwritten, which I know is a problem for many of your students already, especially the boys who have awful handwriting. Okay? Number one, length is important. You have two pieces of paper that are given to you, two lined pieces of paper. Your job is to fill at least a page and a half. If you write a page or less than a page, there is no way you're going to get close to a perfect essay score. You have to practice to write more. As sad as that sounds, these essays are only uh, being considered by about one to two minutes uh, per grader. And that means length is going to be indicative to them of your effort. Okay? So you have to write more. Number two, neatness is going to count. These are not typed. These are handwritten. If the human graders cannot read your handwriting, and by the way, they scan these now. They used to actually hand them uh, the actual uh, answer booklet and your essay to actual live graders. They're now scanned. and We all know how scanning technology is not that perfect, okay? And they will look and look, uh, they will look and read your scanned essay. If they're, ha they're having a difficult time and making it a painful experience for them, they will pay you back with that pain by giving you a lower test score. Organize your essay. This basically means indent your essay paragraphs and make sure they line up. Make sure they line up, okay? Uh, it's sad that I have to say that, but sometimes students treat it like a blog or some kind of Facebook entry or whatever it is that they do nowadays, and they keep it one big block. You don't want to do that, okay? It has to be lined up. 
Number four, the most painful piece of advice, you got to answer the question, okay? Young writers, even the best ones, get really carried away when they're writing essays, especially when it's under time uh, scenarios. So what they typically do is they'll write about a something like a piece of evidence or proof in their body paragraph, but they get carried away describing that piece of evidence as opposed to discussing why they're talking about that evidence. So you might be getting carried away in your second body paragraph writing about the uh, Lord of the Flies and you start writing about Piggy and how he has the conch and his, it's his turn to talk and he runs away from the boys and the bad boys climbed up the mountain and they push the boulder over, hit Piggy in the head, pink stuff oozes out, he drops the conch, his glasses are broken, helicopter lands, adults jump out, adults say you boys are bad, the boys say we're not bad, we're just on an island. That's the whole book, okay? And you've written that whole paragraph and the essay graders thinking, thank you for summarizing Lord of the Flies for me. I've read the book, in fact I wrote the book. You don't need to recap the plot. Tell me why it's important to your thesis. So you have to answer the question. And finally, you guys have to have a conclusion. You must practice this if you're having a difficult time. You have to finish your essay. It's the last thing they will read. It's the last thing they will remember. When your scanned essay document shows up on the computer screen, they go to page one, then they go to page two, and then they go to the grading screen. When they go to the grading screen, they cannot go back. They cannot go back. So that last impression with your conclusion is going to be what they remember. So don't write, sorry, didn't finish, which is something students write. Don't do that. Okay? Okay. So hopefully, in that uh, 45, 50 minutes of time, you guys learned some valuable things. I will be answering questions here in a second. But some things to remember, okay? There's a lot of different things you can you can learn about either test type. If you need to determine if you are better at the SAT or ACT, contact Princeton Review. My contact information will come up in a second. We have a free practice test that combines both SAT and ACT in one sitting so your student doesn't have to sit for eight hours separately, okay, in order to determine the better test. If you are certainly looking for SAT or ACT preparation, contact us. This is what we do. We are testing geeks, okay? So I am a typical Princeton Review person who loves this kind of stuff. You don't have to love it, but we'll teach you how to get past it. And every student can improve significantly. You just have to have the right instruction techniques and materials. I'm going to put up my contact information while I answer some of the questions that you guys put there. Okay? So the first question. Okay? So Meredith, you put down, I've heard that many students score better on one test than the other. Is this true? Is it worth taking both tests to see which I score better on? That is correct. There are plenty of students who, are, who score better on one versus the other. It's a natural skill. It's like somebody who's a good singer or a good painter or a good dancer or a good athlete. Some people are just naturally better at one versus the other. So if it works for things like those skills, of course it works on something like standardized testing. So if you're interested in finding out which one is better for you, contact Princeton Review. By the way, you don't need that combination test that we use if you have at least one test score already. So Meredith, if you've taken the PSAT, you just need to take a practice ACT. Or if you've taken the plan or a practice ACT, then you just need to take a practice SAT, SAT and we can help you with that. Okay? Hannah, do you suggest taking both tests for ease of applying to schools? I wouldn't say it would it's ease, there's ease in taking two four-hour exams. Most teenagers freak out about that. But yes, there are plenty of students who do take both. I'm in Southern California and in Orange County. This is a college aggressive town, okay? UCLA is a backup school in this town, okay? And they shoot for Stanford and Harvard and, and uh, UPenn and Yale, so on and so forth. So if you have a student who is willing to prepare for both and take both, absolutely. I have encountered so many students, hundreds of students, who have seen some magical transformations and improvement in their tests simply because they tried the other exam. Pay no attention to people around you, to peer pressure, to other parents or students who poo-poo the other test type because they feel like it's just something they don't do. 
You should explore both to see which one you are better at. Bethany, if you're better at math than at English, which test should you take? Well, there are caveats to that, but I'll give you a generalization. If you're better at math than at English, then typically the ACT is the easier test for you because the math on there is actually harder, as I said on the SAT, and it's straightforward, okay? It is more straightforward, and therefore it looks and feels like your high school based exam. That's a generalization, of course, uh, but, but, that, uh, but that's one reason to do that, okay? Haley, when do you feel a student should take the SAT or ACT? What do you feel would make a student ready to take the SAT or ACT? Students should take these tests junior year. Junior year. You never want to wait until senior year. That's a bad idea. Okay? So, junior year. Some very advanced testers will take it as early as sophomore year, but that's only if you're scoring that well on the exam. How do you know you're ready for the test? If you take a practice exam and you're scoring in the range of the colleges you want, which is different for each school out there. So once you're in the range or exceeding that range, then you know you are where you want to be. Ralph or Ralph Lynn, if, I, if you have a GPA of 3.3 unweighted, what score do you need to get you help into UCF? Okay, I, don't, uh, I, I assume that's University of, of Central Florida, okay? And not uh, University of California, like San Francisco up there. Well, you would have an S, okay? Um, I don't have that actually memorized, uh, but you can go to collegeboard.org and you can type in uh, the school name on the left-hand side. Then you go to the applying tab and it'll show you, okay? If I were to venture for that GPA you gave on the SAT, you'd probably want to score at least somewhere in the 17 to 1800 mark. And that's if all three sections are being asked for. If it's only two sections of math and reading, that's approximately 12 to 1300, okay? Look it up on collegeboard.org. It's very easy. Okay, Monica, does studying for the SAT prepare you for the ACT as well? Only about 60 to 65 percent. It's not a hundred percent conversion. That's like somebody's playing soccer, asking if that prepares them for football. Not completely. Guys, I'm going to speed up my pace because of my time here. What if your school doesn't? Uh, for Crystal, what if your school doesn't offer the writing portion for ACT? That, that doesn't sound right to me, okay? I don't know if that's just a practice test, but if your school offers the official ACT, they should offer the complete writing section as well. If for some reason they do not, then simply look for another testing site that will be local to your school. You do that via ACT.org. Should you retake the exam with the writing portion? Is that writing portion necessary? Depends on the college, so you need to check. Crystal, if you're applying to universities or private school, you uh, the best, the safe bet, and the answer is yes. You'd have to take it again. Okay, Hannah, top three ways to get your ACT score up by five points to get into your reach school. I went through some of them in this presentation. Obviously, it'll take more than one hour online to improve your score by five points. You're going to want to contact a local Princeton review office to see what programs they have to offer. Hidaya, what's the best ways to study to study for the ACT? Well, I am biased, of course. I've worked for the Princeton Review for 16 years, and you'd have a difficult time finding people in test preparation who've stuck with the same company for that long. So, in my opinion, Princeton Review gives the best way to study for both exams. Okay? Ian, you received a bad score, ACT score. Does this really hurt my admissions chances to college? Do colleges really focus on just one test? Let me answer that in reverse. Colleges do not focus on one test, so perhaps you want to explore the SAT if you still have time. If you're a senior this fall, you do have time. Most colleges will accept until November or December for an SAT or ACT test score. Your ACT test score, even if it's poor, is not the only thing they look at. Their number one focus will be your GPA and the classes you've taken. Having said that, Ian, you're still going to want to try to improve your test score, especially if you're applying to a competitive school. Contact Princeton Review so we can talk to you about how to improve that. Duncan, do graders for the essays prefer the more tried and true five paragraph style or a more college centric, less structured essay? Either one will work as long as it's a well written essay that also follows the advice that I gave to you guys today. So it doesn't have to be a five paragraph, but I would tell you, Duncan, and everybody out there, don't try to write a one or two paragraph either. That's that's basically just as a, that's basically annoying to the graders. So three, four, or five paragraphs is what I would go for. Neymahoon, 
Is the essay for the SAT included in total grade? Yes, it is. It's already incorporated on that. The SAT and ACT both give separate grades. You may not have noticed that on the SAT. You have a separate grade, but it's already integrated into your writing score. On. Are SAT and ACT online or paper? As of right now, mostly on paper. The ACT is testing out online, but uh, for the most part, you're going to do it on paper. You'll want to do it on paper. The interaction, uh, the interaction online is a difficult one, and that's something you'll encounter when you're in college and beyond. Duncan, advantage to submitting both of them? Sure. If you want to submit both SAT and ACT scores, as long as they're both good uh, related to the averages of, the, of that college, absolutely, you can do that. That's almost like just showing off, right? So if your test scores are good for both of them, turn them both in. If they're good at one or bad the, and bad with the other, hide the other one. Okay, turn in, the, turn in just the one that you like, the higher test score. And how do you suggest we prepare for the essay? Same thing, contact Princeton Review. Sonia, do Eastern, do Eastern U.S. schools value SAT more than ACT? Absolutely not. They don't care. And even college websites can be incorrect with their information that they've given. Uh, so I promise you they don't care which one. They care about the test. Melissa, for ACT, is there a version of super scoring? Great question. Super scoring is the idea that you can mix and match your test scores even from different testing days. On the SAT, that's a lot more popular. Your highest reading for one month, highest writing for another month, highest math from another month. The ACT, Sonia, there are fewer schools that do that. Duke University is one of them. I have a list of schools that will super score ACT. Look on my email, email me for that list, and I'll send it to you, okay? I'll answer a few more here, guys, for the next couple of minutes, but just making sure, okay, uh, because um, uh, I don't have the time to answer. You guys have a lot of questions you just sent to me, and you can email them to me as well. So I'll answer a few more, okay? Let's see. Raj, Raj Rajav Avendran, should you prepare for both tests? Only if you feel like it. It would not be efficient, but only if you feel like it, depending on what you're scoring for one or the other. Kenya, I answered that the average score on the SAT is 500 points per section. Ian, the best time to prepare for these tests is summertime between sophomore and junior year. Okay, so you have one more year to go before you prepare for them. Brandon, you don't want to wait until senior year, but if that's the case, you can still send those scores to college. Okay, just a couple more here. Abby, okay, how much does SAT improve your applying? There's no way to mathematically answer that, but, uh, but improving your test scores does improve your chances of getting into college. College is like that, okay? Tania, okay, got a 10 in your writing, but average in every other section. Will they still notice a 10 out of 12 in the writing portion? Not if the application doesn't ask for that. A lot of times they just ask for your composite and the breakdown of each one. So they may not see your essay writing score. Oscar, uh, would you recommend students to purchase the SAT Blue Book or hire a tutor? Either one, really. Okay, if you have the budget for it and your parents are on board and you want to hire a tutor, let's say from Princeton Review, absolutely. A tutor can help answer these things. A, a book is limited in the interaction and you certainly can't ask a book questions okay I like the blue book and it's something we use in our programs as well Kayla how many times can you take the SAT or ACT as many times as you want to they'll take your money it doesn't matter to them okay uh, but theoretically two to three times is really what you want to do with it Cecilia I might actually finish these so almost done Cecilia would you only have to take the ACT with writing once or every time you take it you, you can only take it once if you want to. You don't have to keep taking it if you're satisfied with that. But remember that colleges accept mostly your one-time ACT in the same day. So if you score better on the other one, um, you may not be able to combine those things. And the last one, there's still a couple of questions left. Just email them to me, okay? Um, what's a good way to improve your writing skills? I already answered that with some of the, question, with some of the um, strategies for this one. So uh, if you guys have further questions, email me or contact your local Princeton Review office by calling 800-2-REVIEW, okay? 
I hope you guys learned a lot. A lot of questions to me means that you guys are paying attention, that you do care about these, uh, these topics. I don't have any more time, but contact me, and I'm happy to respond to you guys, okay? Thank you so much, and uh, contact me or the Prince Review. We're happy to help you. Have a great day.